Good evening, I'm Jason Calvert, and this, is the History Tellers. Tonight, we'll be looking into the clash of culture between the Native American peoples and the first English settlers. We'll begin to chronicle the growth and development of the first regional colonial powers, and conclude, with an in-depth analysis of the West Indies plantation slave culture. Tonight, Elise Marie will start the show with her insight into the inevitable clash of culture that took place in the Chesapeake area. When the English landed in 1607, the chieftain Powhatan dominated the native peoples living in the James River area. He had asserted supremacy over a few dozen small tribes, loosely affiliated in what came to be called Powhatan's Confederacy. The English colonists dubbed all the local Indians, somewhat inaccurately, the Powhatans. Powhatan at first may have considered the English potential allies in his struggle to further extend his power over his Indian rivals, and he tried to be conciliatory. But relations between the Indians and the English remained tense, especially as the starving colonists took to raiding Indian food supplies. The atmosphere grew even more strained after Lord de la War arrived in 1610. He carried orders from the Virginia Company that amounted to a declaration of war against the Indians in the Jamestown region. A veteran of the vicious campaigns against the Irish, de la War, now introduced Irish tactics against the Indians. His troops raided Indian villages, burned houses, confiscated provisions, and torched cornfields. A peace settlement ended this first Anglo-Powhatan War in 1614, sealed by the marriage of Pocahontas to the colonist John Rolfe, the first known interracial union in Virginia. A fragile peace followed, which endured eight years. But the Indians, pressed by the land-hungry colonists and ravaged by European diseases, struck back in 1622. A series of Indian attacks left 347 settlers dead, including John Rolfe. In response, the Virginia Company issued new orders calling for a perpetual war without peace or truce, one that would prevent the Indians from being any longer a people. Periodic raids systematically reduced the native population and drove the survivors ever farther westward. In the Second Anglo-Powhatan War, in 1644, the Indians made one last effort to dislodge the Virginians. They were again defeated. The Peace Treaty of 1646 repudiated any hope of assimilating the native peoples into Virginian society or of peacefully coexisting with them. Instead it effectively banished the Chesapeake Indians from their ancestral lands and formally separated Indian from white areas of settlement. By 1669 an official census revealed that only about 2,000 Indians remained in Virginia, perhaps 10% of the population the original English settlers had encountered in 1607. By 1685 the English considered the Powhatan peoples extinct. It had been the Powhatan's calamitous misfortune to fall victim to the three Ds, disease, disorganization, and disposability. Like native peoples throughout the New World, they were extremely susceptible to European-born maladies. Epidemics of smallpox and measles raced mercilessly through their villages. The Powhatans also lacked the unity with which to make effective opposition to the comparatively well-organized and militarily disciplined colonists. Finally, Unlike the Indians whom the Spaniards had encountered to the south, who could be put to work in the mines and had gold and silver to trade, the Powhatans served no economic function for the Virginia colonists. They provided no reliable labor source, and after the Virginians began growing their own crops, had no valuable commodities to offer in commerce. The natives therefore could be disposed of without harm to the colonial economy. Indeed, the Indian presence frustrated the colonists' desire for a local commodity the Europeans desperately wanted, land. For the History Tellers, I'm Elise Marie. The Powhatan people quickly used the presence of the English to strengthen their own power in the region. To their detriment they also quickly succumbed to the same diseases that killed off the native populations of Mexico. The fate of the Powhatans foreshadowed the destinies of indigenous peoples throughout the continent as the process of European settlement went forward. Native Americans, of course, had a history well before Columbus's arrival. They were no strangers to change, adaptation, and even catastrophe, as the rise and decline of civilizations such as the Mississippians and the Anasazis demonstrated. But the shock of large-scale European colonization disrupted Native American life on a vast scale inducing unprecedented demographic and cultural transformations. Some changes were fairly benign. Horses stolen, strayed, or purchased from Spanish invaders, 
catalyzed a substantial Indian migration onto the Great Plains in the 18th century. Peoples such as the Lakotas, who had previously been sedentary forest dwellers, now moved onto the wide open plains. There, they thrived impressively, adopting an entirely new way of life as mounted nomadic hunters. But the effects of contact with Europeans proved less productive for most other native peoples. Disease was by far the biggest disruptor, as old world pathogens spread through biologically defenseless Indian populations. Disease took more than human life, it extinguished entire cultures and occasionally shaped new ones. Epidemics often rob native peoples of the elders who preserved the oral traditions that held clans together. Devastated Indian bands, then faced the daunting task of, literally, reinventing themselves without benefit of accumulated wisdom or kin networks. The decimation and forced migration of native peoples sometimes scrambled them together in wholly new ways. The Catawba Nation of the southern Piedmont region, for example, was formed from splintered remnants of several different groups uprooted by the shock of the Europeans' arrival. Trade also transformed Indian life, as traditional barter and exchange networks gave way to the temptations of European commerce. Firearms, for example, conferred enormous advantages on those who could purchase them from the Europeans. The desire for firearms thus intensified competition among the tribes for access to prime hunting grounds that could supply the skins and pelts that the European arms traders wanted. The result was an escalating cycle of Indian-on-Indian -Indian violence, fueled by the lore and demands of European trade goods. Native Americans were swept up in the expanding Atlantic economy, but they usually struggled in vain to control their own place in it. One desperate band of Virginia Indians, resentful at the prices offered by British traders for their deer skins, loaded a fleet of canoes with hides and tried to paddle to England to sell their goods directly. Not far from the Virginia shore, a storm swamped their frail craft. Their cargo lost, the few survivors were picked up by an English ship and sold into slavery in the West Indies. Indians along the Atlantic seaboard felt the most ferocious effects of European contact. Farther inland, native peoples had the advantages of time, space, and numbers, as they sought to adapt to the European incursion. The Algonquians in the Great Lakes area, for instance, became a substantial regional power. They bolstered their population by absorbing various surrounding bands and dealt from a position of strength with a few Europeans who managed to penetrate the interior. As a result, a British or French trader wanting to do business with the inland tribes had little choice but to conform to Indian ways, often taking an Indian wife. In this way a middle ground was created, a zone where both Europeans and Native Americans were compelled to accommodate each another, at least until the Europeans began to arrive in large numbers. Our next segment, reported by Alexander Ryan, takes an in-depth look at the origin story of Virginia. Looking back, at early Virginia, it's safe to say, that it struggled early on in its development. When tobacco was introduced into Europe the effect was dramatic, and changed the entire course of the world overnight. And in Virginia, tobacco grew like no other crop known to mankind at the time. John Ralph, the husband of Pocahontas, became father of the tobacco industry, and an economic savior of the Virginia colony. By 1612 he had perfected methods of raising and curing the pungent weed, eliminating much of the bitter tang. Soon the European demand for tobacco was nearly insatiable. A tobacco rush swept over Virginia, as crops were planted in the streets of Jamestown, and even between the numerous graves. So exclusively did the colonists concentrate on planting the yellow leaf that at first, they had to import some of their food supplies. Colonists who had once hungered for food now hungered for land, ever more land on which to plant ever more tobacco. Relentlessly, they pressed the frontier of settlement up the river valleys to the west, abrasively edging against the Indians. Virginia's prosperity was finally built on tobacco smoke. This bewitching weed played a vital role in putting the colony on firm economic foundations. But tobacco enchained the fortunes of Virginia to the fluctuating price of a single crop. Fatefully, tobacco also promoted a large land plantation system, and with it a brisk demand for fresh labor. In 1619, the year before the Plymouth Pilgrims landed in New England, what was described as a Dutch warship appeared off Jamestown and sold some 20 Africans. The scanty record does not reveal whether they were purchased as lifelong slaves or as servants committed to limited years of servitude. However, this simple commercial transaction planted the seeds of the North American slave system. Yet black slaves were too costly for most of the hard-pinched white colonists to acquire, and for decades few were brought to Virginia. In 1650, Virginia counted 300 black persons, although by the end of the century, blacks, most of them enslaved, made up approximately 14% of the colony's population. 
Representative self-government was also born in primitive Virginia, in the same cradle with slavery, and in the same year, 1619. The London Company authorized the settlers to summon an assembly, known as the House of Burgesses. A momentous precedent was then established, for this assemblage was the first of many miniature parliaments to flourish in the soil of America. As time passed, James I grew increasingly hostile to Virginia. He detested tobacco, and he distrusted the representative House of Burgesses, which he branded a seminary of sedition. In 1624, he revoked the charter of the bankrupt and beleaguered Virginia Company, thus making Virginia a royal colony directly under his control. For the History Tellers, I'm Alexander Ryan. Maryland, the fourth English colony to be planted, was the second plantation colony, founded in 1634 by Lord Baltimore of a prominent English Catholic family. He embarked upon the venture partly to reap financial profits and partly to create a refuge for his fellow Catholics. Protestant England was still persecuting Roman Catholics, among numerous discriminations, a couple seeking wedlock could not be legally married by a Catholic priest. Absentee proprietor, Lord Baltimore hoped that the 200 settlers who founded Maryland at St. Mary's on the Chesapeake Bay, would be the vanguard of a vast new feudal domain. Huge estates were to be awarded to his largely Catholic relatives, and gracious manor houses, modeled on those of England's aristocracy, were intended to arise amidst the fertile forests. As in Virginia, colonists proved willing to come only if offered the opportunity to acquire land of their own. Soon they were dispersed around the Chesapeake region on modest farms, and the haughty land barons, mostly Catholic, were surrounded by resentful backcountry planters, mostly Protestant. Resentment flared into open rebellion near the end of the century, and the Baltimore family for a time lost its proprietary rights. Despite these tensions Maryland prospered. Like Virginia, it blossomed forth in acres of tobacco. Also like Virginia, it depended for labor in its early years on white indentured servants. Penniless persons who bound themselves to work for a number of years to pay their passage. In both colonies, it was only in the later years of the 17th century that black slaves began to be imported in large numbers. Lord Baltimore permitted freedom of worship at the outset. He hoped that he would thus purchase toleration for his own fellow worshippers. But the heavy tide of Protestants threatened to submerge the Catholics and place severe restrictions on them, as in England. Faced with disaster, the Catholics of Maryland threw their support behind the famed Act of Toleration, which was passed in 1649 by the local representative assembly. Maryland's new religious statute guaranteed toleration to all Christians. But, less liberally, it decreed the death penalty for those, like Jews and atheists, who denied the divinity of Jesus. The law thus sanctioned less toleration than had previously existed in the settlement, but it did extend a temporary cloak of protection to the uneasy Catholic minority. One result was that when the colonial era ended, Maryland probably sheltered more Roman Catholics than any other English-speaking colony in the New World. In our final segment of the night, Gabrielle René takes a look at the West Indies, and the origins of plantation slave culture. It was the adoption of harsh West Indies slave procedures that would find its way to America, and firmly place the future United States on a path of civil destruction. While the English were planting the first colonies in the Chesapeake, they also were busily colonizing the West Indies. Spain, weakened by military overextension and distracted by its rebellious Dutch provinces, relaxed its grip on the Caribbean in the early 1600s. By the mid-17th century, England had secured its claim to several West Indian islands, including the large prize of Jamaica in 1655. Sugar formed the foundation of the West Indian economy. What tobacco was to the Chesapeake, sugar cane was to the Caribbean, with one crucial difference. Tobacco was a poor man's crop. It could be planted easily, it produced commercially marketable leaves within a year, and it required only simple processing. Sugar cane, in contrast, was a rich man's crop. It had to be planted extensively to yield commercially viable quantities of sugar. Extensive planting, in turn, required extensive and arduous land clearing and the cane stalks yielded their sugar only after an elaborate process of refining in a sugar mill, and to run the mills, made sugar cultivation a capital-intensive business. Only wealthy growers with abundant capital to invest could succeed in sugar. The sugar lords extended their dominion over the West Indies in the 17th century. To work their sprawling plantations, they imported enormous numbers of African slaves, more than a quarter of a million in the five decades after 1640. 
By about 1700, black slaves outnumbered white settlers in the English West Indies by nearly four to one, and the region's population has remained predominantly black ever since. To control this large and potentially restive population of slaves, English authorities devised formal codes that defined the slaves' legal status and master's prerogatives. The notorious Barbados Slave Code of 1661 denied even the most fundamental rights to slaves and gave masters virtually complete control over their laborers, including the right to inflict vicious punishments for even slight infractions. The profitable sugar plantation system soon crowded out almost all other forms of Caribbean agriculture. The West Indies increasingly depended on the North American mainland for foodstuffs and other basic supplies, and smaller English farmers squeezed out by the greedy sugar barons, began to migrate to the newly founded southern mainland colonies. A group of displaced English settlers from Barbados arrived in Carolina in 1670. They brought with them a few African slaves, as well as the model of the Barbados Slave Code, which eventually inspired statutes governing slavery throughout the mainland colonies. Carolina officially adopted a version of the Barbados Slave Code in 1696. Just as the West Indies had been a testing ground for the encomienda system that the Spanish has brought into Mexico and South America, so the Caribbean islands now served as a staging area for the slave system that would take root elsewhere in English North America. Reporting for the History Tellers, I am Gabrielle René. Slave culture would grow and expand throughout the southern colonies. A once unprofitable enterprise, slavery, would be strengthened, solidified and codified into law, and all of it fueled by the profits from tobacco. Thank you for watching Part 2 of The Planting of English America. Stay tuned for Part 3, where we look at the further colonization of the South, and the differences that began to emerge between the Northern, Middle, and Southern regions of colonial North America. Remember, history is not a lecture to be heard, but a story to be told. For the History Tellers, I'm Jason Calvert. Good night.